Hi, and welcome to our Bible study entitled, What Makes Lutherans Lutheran? Today we're in the uh, 10th part of this series, and I don't know whether we're even halfway uh, done yet. But ever, whatever that we are, we are looking at what are some of the differences uh, that differentiate Lutherans from the rest of Christianity as a whole. Uh, I'd like to start off as we normally do with a quick review of uh, what we covered in part nine. And in there, we were talking about what is truth. And bottom line is God's word is the ultimate truth. This is where, you know, the rubber meets the road. This is what absolute truth is. Truth isn't relative, it's absolute. We also talked about the content of the Bible, and in approximately 400 AD, they codified what the Bible was. It, they codified it as 66 books written over 3,600 years by approximately 30 officers, 30, 30 authors, excuse me. We also looked into God does not contradict himself. When he uh, put a uh, sentence of death on the city of Nineveh, the Ninevites, when Jonah preached to them, they repented. And when God saw that their repentance, he was very happy and he took the sentence of death over the city off. And this isn't because he's uh, wishy-washy, but God desires repentance. God desires people to turn from their evil and turn to him. So he does not uh, contradict himself. He does, however, show his mercy time and time again. Uh, we looked at the law and how it acts as a curb to keep us from doing various things, how it acts as a mirror to show us our sins. And when we see that we can't um, come up to God's standard, we understand and we see that we have a need for a savior. And it's also the law acts as a guide to show us how we should live. Um, the gospel is God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. When we see that we're sinful, when we see that we can't bridge the gap between us and a righteous God, only Christ can do that. And by him being incarnate, coming into this world, living a life that you and I cannot live and will not live, that's one without sin. And yet, when going to the cross, God heaped all of our sins on him, and he paid for all of our sins, for all of mankind, for all time. When you start thinking about what that entails, it becomes pretty awe-inspiring because Jesus paid for my sins. He paid for your sins as well. So when we stand in front of God, we no longer have sin. What God sees is a righteous person. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But by the grace of God, we were given it. Now, we can reject that salvation. We can say, no, we're not interested. We don't want it. And God will keep pestering us. He will keep coming to us and getting us to try to turn from our ways. But ultimately, we have the final say. We can't say that we're going to be saved. God does that. But we can walk away from his salvation we can turn and walk away and reject it. That's the only thing we can do. When we um, are saved, that is, it's through faith by grace alone. And through our faith in Jesus Christ, this is how we are saved. It's not our doing, it is totally God's doing. 
and we'll get in a little bit more detail in that today. The next thing we'll be covering is God's Word, the Gospel. We covered the law in our last segment, and today we'll be looking at the Gospel and what it entails. Now, there are various views of what the Gospel is, but let, let me summarize it uh, in, in brief for you. The gospel is God's plan of salvation. The gospel is what Christ has done for us on our behalf. As I said earlier, Christ took on all the sins of the world for all mankind for all time, and he paid the price. God demanded that a blood price be paid for sin. Uh, with uh, when the moral law was still in effect, we had the sacrificial system. With the fulfillment of God's promise in the uh, incarnation of Jesus Christ, we now have, we no longer have a need for the sacrificial system because Christ was the one last sacrifice required. So we now have been saved, and let's take a look at how various uh, denominations look at the gospel. When we take a look at the Orthodox Church, they say that we humans receive the gospel, and that means that we humans have a part in that uh, salvation uh, uh, drama. We get to accept it. Now, Lutherans have a slightly different view. They believe that God's gift of faith via the Holy Spirit is the mechanism on which we get salvation. Now, man does have a... Uh, does have a role in this. Man can reject that salvation. Um, think about a uh, hungry person that you lead to the table. They can decide, no, I don't want the food that you have put in front of me. I would rather continue to starve. Lutherans look at it very similar. We come to the table, God gives us this gift of grace, of faith, and through that we are saved. But we can reject it. We can push it away and say, no, we're not in, uh, we're not um, party to that. We don't want to be a part of it. You know, we don't just leave us alone. Now, we take a look at some of the other uh, denominations within Christianity. The Reformed um, says only the, le the elect justified from the beginning, but they aren't justified until the Holy Spirit applies Christ to them. Now, I'm not going to get into great detail, but the Reformed have a a concept of once saved, always saved. And we will get into that in a future, uh, future part of the study. Uh, but right now, only the elect are justified, but not until the Holy Spirit applies Christ to them. Uh, the Roman Church, uh, uh, human ascends to cooperate with the grace of God. And there we see again, man has a role, man has a part. Um, and the, method, uh, the Methodist, they believe that no good will exists unless it's by an action of God, so that the good will is given to the person by God, um, which is, uh, you, we can argue uh, some things ab uh, about that, of whether the man is involved or not. But for this, we're just going to go with what they say uh, about, the, about man himself. And then uh, Baptist, 
is that salvation is a free gift to all by the gospel and the human accepts it and only the human can reject it. Uh, the Baptists have a concept of the age of accountability. Uh, usually it's somewhere between 12 and 14 years old where you can accept Christ. That leaves into question what hap <coughs> excuse me, what happens to the person prior to that time? Are they sinless? Are they covered by some other mechanism? Um, neither of which are defined in the Bible. Um, one of the other things that argues against it is that in the four Gospels, they have accounts of where an entire household is baptized. Um, and by entire household, from the very old to the very young, and everyone in between would be baptized. And the early church fathers also did not have a problem with infant baptism. Um, and so this concept of age of accountability doesn't have a scriptural uh, backing. And in, in fact, when you look at church history and church tradition, the early church fathers had no issue and no, they did not write against baptizing an infant. Uh, the liberal um, sects of Christianity uh, tend to interpret salvation in terms of Jesus's ability to create in his disciples a trust in God. Um, they talk about um, whether uh, sin is in the, in the non-psychological nature in which we inherit, in which case they look at, you know, the, ver the couple, of the two twin natures of Christ. Um, but they also have uh, this thing about this God conscience and how that interacts with man. Um, it is a parsing of salvation that, again, has no biblical um, um, backing to it, but it is a result of the Age of Enlightenment. Um, now, we have some a couple of scripture readings here, and I'd like to read from Exodus 20, uh, verses 1 to 3. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of sla slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Um, one of the things that God is setting down is that he is a jealous God. He wants our devotion, our worship, and he doesn't want it giving to any other uh, uh, God, and God in air quotes. Um, and we tend to do that. We tend to place our faith and trust in all sorts of things. Um, it might be in your job and retirement plan, in your wealth, in your family. We put all of these things in place of God, and that is what we devote our time and, and worship to. Um, now, going on, we have a passage from Isaiah 53, and this will be fairly familiar to many of you. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us are like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. We traditionally read this passage during Christmas. When Christ is, we remember Christ is coming into a sin-filled world. He is here to begin his mission of rescue for the fallen people. Remember, God had made a 
promise, a covenant with man. And he said, and when Abram uh, sacrificed the animals and he put, he cut the animals in half. And then God passed through that. Abraham did not. And the significance of that is when God passed through it, he is saying, I will commit to do everything in my power to keep this covenant, to keep this agreement. But further, it obligates him a bit more. It also says, I will do everything in my power to help you keep your side of the covenant. And as a sin-filled man, we can't. We can't live the life that we need to and that we should. We sin. We sin daily. And what God did is he knew that, he knew our nature, and he sent his son to take on our sin. And we read about this in Isaiah 53. All of our sins fell on Jesus. He paid for them all. We don't pay anything. We don't uh, suffer in a mythical place called purgatory. We, it is done. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, our salvation was complete. We add nothing to it. Now we have a couple, uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, uh, passage from Romans, and let me read this for you, if I if I might. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for that in which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation, there will be a tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first, but also the Greek. And what God is saying here, um, I'm going to highly summarize, is that without Christ, without the grace of God, you stand on your own merit or lack thereof. And when God looks at you and without the grace of God, without the vicarious atonement of Jesus, he looks at you and he's going to weigh. Has this person done good or evil in his life? And when we look at it without the grace of God, it is we have done evil and we reap our just rewards. If we have faith in Jesus and that we have Jesus's righteousness, which we got in our baptism, then, you know, we are looked at not as sinners, but as saints, people that have been reconciled to God, that are wholly righteous, that have been made whole by the blood of Christ, and that we take comfort in. And now uh, a part uh, from Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us as adoptions to sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. 
in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. God chose people that were going to be saved. You know, let's ignore a minute, you know, well, how does this happen? And we'll get into that in, in a little bit later in the study. I don't want to get into that uh, topic right now. But God chose those that were going to be saved from the found, before the foundations of the world were laid down. He knew those that would be holy and made holy and blameless, not through their own merit, but through the blood of Christ. It is strictly and wholly by God's grace that we are saved. We have nothing to add to it. We have nothing at all. If, if you really want to get down to it, the only thing we add to the equation is our sin. And by adding our sin, it sh magnifies exactly how merciful and how gracious and how loving our God is that he is willing to forgive this. I had a question um, some time ago that I will address now. And why doesn't God save everyone? And, that, and that's a good question. And it comes down to really one thing. There are some people in this world that keep pushing God away. Throughout their lives, they keep pushing him away. They don't believe in what he says. They don't believe his word. They don't want to be involved. They don't want to be bothered. They're too busy whatever the excuse, whatever the reason is, they push God away. And God keeps coming back to them and trying to encourage them to repent. It may be through friends. It may be through uh, television programs that they hear a preacher. It may be that they're coming to church and have heard the word of God. Maybe they've picked up a Bible while traveling uh, in a hotel room. But God uses all these opportunities to try to bring the lost sheep back. And if that person still rejects and continues to reject and continues not to believe, upon their death, God gives them what they have desired. He gives them separation from God. As a Christian, we would call this hell, total separation from God. Um, a lot of us, um, or some people, have a understanding of hell as, you know, we have the cartoon where the devil is playing with the, thermo uh, the thermostat, you know, turning up the heat. But in hell, Satan is not in charge. God is in charge. God is completely and totally separa separated himself from Satan and these people who have chosen this. And so that will be, that is probably the best definition of hell that we have, is that there is a to total and complete separation from God. We know that this is an agonizing thing because Jesus on the cross, when he is bearing the sins of everyone, cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God has isolated himself from that. But God also raised him from the dead because he had led that perfect life. He was righteous. And when he raised Jesus from the dead, it assures us believers that we too will rise from the dead. And that gives us great comfort. Christians will face death. We go through death and we look at it as a portal. It doesn't make it any easier 
but as we face death, we understand that it's nothing to fear. It's not the end. It's really the beginning. And let me talk about the beginning. You know, for us, it's the beginning of life with God in fellowship with him. You know, you don't get a pair of wings. You don't not going to be playing a harp for all eternity. Um, but you are in relationship with God, your creator, and everything is perfect. There is no pain. There is no suffering. Um, there is only joy. And this is what we look forward to. You know, this is the heaven that we talk about. Now, that is the end of part 10. Um, and we will pick up again next time. I do want to apologize. We had some technical difficulties last week and weren't able to produce a, a, a tape. However, we will continue to do this. Um, until that time, may God bless your studies. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me through either of our Facebook pages or through an email. May God bless you.